written in this one-sided society that a man can't be beautiful. Although female characters tend to get most of the attention when it comes to sex appeal and fan service, that doesn't mean there isn't a diverse spectrum of alluring guys that are quite easy on the eyes, ranging from dashing heroes, dark bad boys, charismatic fighters, and androgynous pretty boys, there's no shortage of sexy men for the ladies, and other men, to drool over. As for how we're measuring the sexiness of the bosses, there's a different criteria. How much fan service do they provide? How much skin do they show for no reason other than pure sex appeal? How much internet thirst and apologists do they generate? And just like last year, I brought in some help since being a straight guy means I'm unable to provide objective measures on these bosses. All right, this is my kind of list. Not mine. Don't worry, honey. Next year we'll do sexy female bosses. We really don't talk about Chrono Trigger enough on this channel, do we? You have a JRPG released by Square in its prime featuring time travel with characters designed by Akira Toriyama. What's not to like? Among the many iconic characters of the game is Magus. Magus? 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 Uh, hang on a second. Magus. Ah, that's unhelpful. Introduced as Frog's rival and our initial villain, Magus is no slouch in the dangerously sexy department. He's got a scythe, flowing long hair, vampire fangs, pointy legless ears, and rippling biceps. As a boss, Magus is your classic barrier-changing boss. That, coupled with his shadow attacks, means you really gotta have good elemental variety. But what really makes Magus appealing is his backstory. At first glance, he seems like your typical JRPG villain. Commit evil deeds and summon the all-powerful elder abomination, Lavos. But after you beat him, it turns out that Magus was actually fighting for good all along. He wasn't trying to summon Lavos so he could destroy the world, he was trying to do it so he could kill Lavos. And when that doesn't work, you have the ability to recruit him into your party. And I don't know about you, but I get the feeling a number of people would gladly trade places with Shala in the whole traveling through time to find the person you care the most about scenario. Plus, there's that alluring confidence he has. No joke, I showed Magus's image to one of my employees, as well as the quote, If my fate is to be destroyed, I must simply laugh. And they turned into putty. I think that says something. Ah, oh, vampires. Who doesn't find these fellows attractive? When they don't sparkle! There's something about the mysticism, the gothic romance, and the conflict of forbidden love between man and monster that really gets some people ecstatic. And who do we thank for that, other than the age-old precursor of gothic romance himself, Dracula. Yes, I know it's cheating, I don't care, it's sort of my list, shut up. Dracula has many iterations across media, from literature to films to Adam Sandler. I don't say blah, blah, blah. But we're mainly focusing on the Castlevania version, the one who plagues mankind and haunts the Belmont legacy for years to come. He poses as the primary antagonist across the series as the fireball-checking, bat-shifting final boss we all know. And it's not Dracula if he doesn't have a super spooky second form, whether it's a muscular demon, some creepy amalgamated heads, or rats? Where the rats? On the appeal side of things, Dracula's got quite the figure. He easily towers over all versions of Belmont, who are already so buff they could be their own JoJo's. Add the glorious silver hair in Symphony of the Night, as well as his demon forms, tight tights. <laughs> and you got yourself a monster who's all for fashion and class, in loose terms. And like his other media variants, this Dracula also comes with his own tragedy. Holding a deep hatred for mankind for killing his wife, all he wanted was to see that they pay by dying before the might of his undead army. It took Alucard to remind him of his wife's kindness and humane values for him to snap back into reality and realize his folly. While you could argue there are more attractive versions of Dracula out there, Castlevania's version still stays true to the essence that gave him the influential appeal to begin with. He's mysterious, he's tragic, he's captivatingly dangerous, and most of all, he's a quality dilf. And hey, if it doesn't work out with a dad, there's always the son, he's less likely to kill me anyways. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, the debate over best Pokemon Husbando has raged on since time immemorial. There have been so many great candidates throughout the years. The cool and enigmatic Steven Stone of Hoenn. The socially awkward yet kind-hearted N. I'd go on, but to list every potential Pokemon Husbando would take all day. However, for us, there is but one choice. One man who raises above the rest. A man of science and action. I present to you, Professor Kukui. Wait, 
I hear you cry. Isn't Kukui married? Well, yes, but I ask you to consider the following. Abs. Also, the fact that he's married is a plus to some people. It shows he can maintain a good, stable, healthy relationship. But seriously, how do you make someone with this much hot, fun uncle energy with a dash of himbo vibes and not expect people to go crazy over him? He spends most of the time wearing nothing but his lab coat and somehow gets even more shirtless when he's the masked royal? Who doesn't want that? You also have to admit that soul patch thing he has going on somehow works too. Sycamore tried to do something similar and looks suave and debonair, but that French fop got nothing on Rugged Island Man. And of course, you can't talk about what makes Kukui such a great husbando without mentioning all the work he puts into building the Pokemon League in Alola. It shows Kukui cares about his home, can dream big, can achieve great things when he puts his mind to it, and has great organizational skills. Who wouldn't want a man who can do all that? Unfortunately, as much as she said earlier that Kukui being married is a plus for his attractiveness to some people, it's also why we can't justify putting him higher on the list. He's completely devoted to his wife and she's completely devoted to him, even if she somehow doesn't realize Kukui is the Mast Royal. Ace Attorney. Well, this is a toughie. Not that there are a lot of sexy men to choose from, it's just the ones that are there are really good. You got the fan favorite Edgeworth, the edgy Black Quill, the suave Clavier, and Apollo is there too. But if we want to embrace the sheer darkness that broods within our hearts, we need to go with the man whose soul is as deep and murky as his favorite drink, coffee. With a form-fitting suit and a devilish smile to match, the mysterious prosecutor Godot finally arrives. We were tired of waiting. For those who don't know, Godot acts as the main prosecutor rival throughout Trials and Tribulations. Despite being around for one game, he makes a lasting impression. From the get-go, you see this mysterious masked man and wonder what the heck his whole deal is. As you go through the game, you slowly learn pieces of his backstory. You see how suave, elegant, and charming he is to everyone, except for Phoenix. And that theme of his just adds to his appeal. And then case four starts and then boom, old daddy to young daddy with that raven hair and sharp grin. Diego Armando adds an extra man for the price of one. This all culminates in the final case, which wraps up his character beautifully. Despite being the main rival, he ends up becoming the final culprit, one Phoenix needs to take down without help from anyone. Godot is a man who had everything important taken from him at once, plunged into a five-year coma, now left alone in the world and yet still sacrifices himself to save that last piece of Mia left, Maya. Yeah, I know you guys are all, but my edgy poop, let's be fair. Remember those three prosecutors I mentioned, Gato is edgy, suave, and a fan favorite. He's the perfect package and one Ace Attorney fan swoon over. Oh boy, Fire Emblem. It's hard to pick just one from this series because with the dozens of hot dudes that we fight across the games, we're gonna get a ton of people angry no matter who we pick. As cheap as it might be, we might have to toss a dart on the board of some of the top candidates. So let's see who we're landing on here today. Well, there you go. Claude seems to be the one Lord in Three Houses that got a lot of people's F-boy senses tingling. And who can blame them? Dude's got a beautiful complexion, a suave voice, and in the time skip, he even got a beard. And man, does he rock it. Bonus points for also being a sick <laughs> wyvern rider with a knack for the bow. As a character, Claude's the most simple of the three lords, but in many ways, he's also the easiest one to like. He can be mischievous and always sounds like he's flirting whenever he talks. Seriously, he chose to dance with you at the ball, whether you're male or female Byleth. But even with that said, he's also very keen and takes the situation seriously when it truly matters. He doesn't go on a psychotic spree as easily as the other two do. And while some might say he lacked layers because of this, others find comfort in knowing that at least someone is still sane around here. Even in Three Hopes, while he did succumb to full-blown Machiavellianism, it still took a bit for him to get there. As a boss, the most notable moment where you fight him is in Crimson Flower, where Edelgard, in all her masquering majesty, decided to go after the capital of Leicester. Claude not only has Hilda's squad by his side, but he also has the Wyvern Knights of Elmira encroaching from the ports. And yeah, it's a pretty painful fight. Not because the map design is bad or anything, but because Claude is cunning and he isn't even trying to pick a fight. He even ordered Hilda to retreat when the situation gets too harsh, but to no avail. This is pretty much the closest we get to a Camus fight in this game. When you finally pin Claude, ooh, he at least has the wit to negotiate himself out of being executed, so you get to pick whether or not he gets to keep his guts. 
So unlike other Camus likes, you do get to save him. Sure, he lost everything and had to deport himself, but at least he's alive. Claude definitely has a lot to like about him between his great looks, welcoming personality, sharp mind, and tragic disposition. However, he does lose a few points as looking at three hopes, it's understandable how people can be severely turned off by how Machiavellian he gets. Plus, some of the stuff he says to his former comrades is disheartening, to say the least. But when he isn't joining the psycho party, Claude still remains as enjoyable as ever. And besides, I gotta give him props for killing Randolph twice. Fuck Randolph. Hello, hot stuff. I'm so flattered! As well you should be. And it was unnecessary. Always. So, in my last list, I performed a terrible crime. I didn't make a Kingdom Hearts reference. Yes, very sad. Anyway. Time to remedy this. Once again, Axel makes a list. With how often he shows up, you'd think he'd have enough frequent flyer miles to make the trip to Disneyland Tokyo. Jokes aside, I can't really think of anyone else I'd want to put on here from this franchise. No, not even Darkness Boy Jr. or Mansex and his Zebra 90. And even though his look is a mishmash of concepts, he pulls it off with aplomb. He's literally too hot to handle. I'm in pain. Axel's prowess as a boss has been explained to death on this channel. He has simple fun in his original fight, but can get extremely complex in his data battles, though never to the point it's unfair. As for backstory, well, he has the common problem of organization members and that he just doesn't seem to have a heart. He's just a body without emotions, but with incredible fire powers. And what a body he has. But if the Wizard of Oz's words are anything to go by, then Axel's heart is incredibly large. As is his sex appeal. I mean, look at him. Lean, streamlined, piercing aquamarine eyes, raspy, snarky voice. Just so much right up my alley. I don't think we should go on too long, as there are at least like five <laughs> other lists on this channel with even more details about him. But Axel is easily one of the best characters in the franchise, both in terms of character and... Ugh, sex appeal. There, there, honey. You'll always be my favorite hothead. I feel like you're putting words in my mouth. Don't you dare. Okay. Let's dance. Oh lord, I think I'm coming down with a case of the vapors. That line alone cemented him a spot on this list. Yeah, I can't even argue there. Whenever I bring up Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, usually the first thing I bring up is Senator Armstrong, the powerhouse of well-intentioned extremism, memes, and nano machines, son! Yeah, sorry, but there's just too much beef for my taste. No, this time around, how about something with a hint of Brazilian spice? Jetstream Sam Rodriguez is a Brazilian samurai, so, uh, I guess add a little Japanese spice there, too? I don't know. Heck, he's also a cyborg, so he's a cultural melting pot at this point. He's also the perfect opposite of our protagonist, Raiden. While Raiden is a hammy ninja who attacks from the shadows, Sam is a calm and sarcastic samurai who isn't afraid to take the enemy head on. Also, he clearly has a jaw, lovingly coated with scruff. Also, packing a reasonable amount of beef. Ooh, and the cherry on top. I'm sure the guys behind Teen Titans Go would love him. Anyways, obviously, Sam's a walking, slicing package of handsome. But I also appreciate how subtle he is. And in this franchise, that's saying something. In a game that will dogpile you with memes galore, it's nice to have one rival that's a little more down to earth. And as another bonus, he's the playable character of his own DLC, where we get a little taste of his backstory. Turns out he used to fight to take down Armstrong's forces, but he couldn't keep up and eventually joined those he hoped to destroy. Of course, we all know Armstrong's true goals for the world, so in a way, Sam was still doing good for the country. Just in a more extreme way, and one that cost him his right arm. It adds a lot more complexity to those finger licking thighs and makes him more interesting inside and outside. So how do I sum up my feelings for him? Well, I'll let Sam speak for himself. Oh, good. <laughs> Why, that's very good. Yes, I like that. Maybe this is just me being the embodiment of everything that Tumblr hates, but what straight women and gay men thirst over often baffles me. 
You guys think Jafar is sexy. You think Dr. Facilier is sexy. You think Frollo is sexy. These grody old bean poles are sexy to you? Then it had to be patiently explained to me the three things that people found sexy about these characters. Their vast power, their confidence, and their stylized fashion, as well as their deep, sexy voices. So what happens when you take the vast power, unusual fashion, and sexy voice, and throw that into a traditionally attractive body? Didn't think anyone was left. You must be pretty tough. Huh. Oh no, he's high! Can't argue with that math, dear. For whatever reason, Resident Evil Village managed to make players thirsty for two notable newbies. For the fellows, there's Lady Step On Me Mommy Domitresk. And for the ladies, there was... Heisenberg, you're goddamn right. Meet Carl Heisenberg, a member of Mother Miranda's little cult of X-Men rejects the four houses. He and Lady Domitresk are arguably the best looking Bradys in the bunch. Not a lot of competition, considering the other two are either demonic puppeteers or... Oh, that's just unfortunate. Anyways, he's the engineer of the group, a living Dr. Frankenstein who uses his talents to create cyborg zombies. To go with his gadgeteer character, he also has electric organs that allow him magnetic control over metal. Say it. Wow, talk about a magnetic personality. Just shoot me. Speaking of personality, he's a ham, a smarmy, pint-sized little ham with the bravado of a game show host. Lycans and gentlemen. We thank you for waiting. And now let the games begin! Already taken in by his scruffy looks, rugged charm, surprising charisma, and unique powers? How about we spice it up with his sympathetic backstory? Yeah, spoiler alert, he hates Miranda and will do anything to break away from her. Yeah, it kind of means using your daughter as a weapon, but can you blame him? He never asked to be in her twisted club, but she used him like a guinea pig. Now look at him! How'd you like to wake up to that every morning? Yeah, it's so sad to lose scrappy Heisey like this, but it adds more to the tragedy this guy has been through. Honestly, I'm pretty sure some people out there would have wanted to join him, if for no other reason than to touch the scruff. Hmm, scruffy hammy guys with a lot of energy. Doesn't ring any bells. Everyone loves the Rebel Harry. If there was a series that embodies that true bad boy energy, it would be the Yakuza series. Every character and boss in the series just has that perfect body chiseled out of marble with their entire history just written all over their face, and sometimes all over in their tattoos. It was really hard to choose one out of a sea of Davids, but when we thought about it, the choice was actually pretty obvious. We got to go with the perfect blend of bad boy and perfect gentleman vibes, our main man Kiryu. Let's get an elephant out of the way. Yes, Kiryu is a boss, figuratively and literally. He was in charge of the Tojo clan for like a week in Yakuza 1. Okay, he was a boss a few times, starting Yakuza 4 forward, most notably in Yakuza 7, like a dragon as one of the late game bosses. That fight is tough. Really shows off the power he emits as he beats the crap out of every hooligan in Yakuza up and down Japan. Being the main protag of the whole series, you see Kiryu develop from a young, clean-shaven, smoking businessman to father of one, stay-at-home daddy energy in the later games. He can do it all, sing, dance, act, run a business, raise a child, play video games well, run a cabaret club, lead an army of construction workers and hooligans and against invaders, fight off zombies, fend off a stalker assassin, throw people into microwaves, sword fight, and not be phased by taking damage. Wow, this guy has a resume! Despite his rough exterior, he is actually super suave and respectful at all times. While he doesn't fight women, he will fight beside them and acknowledge their strength. He shows deference to both his allies and enemies, making them begrudgingly respect him back at times. And despite being occasionally dorky, he still takes everything seriously, no matter how ridiculous it seems. Kiryu is one of the manliest and sexiest men in all of gaming. He'd probably be number one on this list too, if number one wasn't as obvious as it should be. Jack of Blades. Excellent fashion sense, and each voice is malevolent in their own right. Perhaps we're never showing his face. Shadow the Hedgehog. He's non-traditional, but everybody loves a project. Super Macho Man! If you were to ask us which series has the hottest male bosses, it'd be Final Fantasy. 
As early as 2, this series has given us a never-ending supply of pretty boys, muscle men, and everything in between. This could have easily been the top 10 sexiest Final Fantasy bosses. The Emperor is basically David Bowie if he was the villain in a fantasy story. And y'all remember how hot he was the first time that happened? Golbez from 4 may seem like just another giant armored dude, but after years revealed he's just as hot as his brother. And he wears next to nothing. Say what you will about Kefka's makeup and chaotic insanity, but there are people out there who would gladly be the Harley Quinn to his Joker. Cypher is the classic rival character who was manipulated by the main villain, so he's a redemption fic. Kuja is... Well, look at him. Jacked is an absolute hunk who's canonically a delf. Judge Gabranth has all the sex appeal of his twin brother, plus a British accent. Caius is a tragic villain who's cursed to never save the girl he cares the most about. Hello, self-insert shipping bait. Here we go. And Arden is the closest we will get to having Johnny Depp in a Final Fantasy game. Of course, all of those pale in comparison to the one, the only. Yeah, tell me you're surprised. Sephiroth is easily the most iconic villain of the franchise, as well as its most thirsted over. From the leather ensemble, to the confident smirk, to the smooth voice, he just oozes sex appeal. It's not like the designers didn't realize he was hot. There's a reason he was shirtless during two of his boss fights. Heck, there was actually a life-sized naked statue of him in Square Enix's cafe at one point. In the story, Sephiroth is the archetypal fallen hero. He was once the paragon of soldier, only to fall into chaotic insanity once he learned of his true origin. Right there, we already have easy evidence for fangirls and boys to claim that he was just a good guy who was led astray by the true villain, Genova. Never mind the whole word of God saying otherwise and destroying the world thing. Whatever. Everything this guy does just radiates confidence and coolness, especially that little moment at Nivelheim where he just smiles as he slowly turns and walks into the flames. Sephiroth's sexiness is so potent that it can't even be contained to one franchise. His presence has graced Kingdom Hearts, Smash Bros, and even Little Big Planet. Little Big Planet? The, 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 the game with the hacky sack creature? Is that that's the right that's the right game? And with the remake confirming there'll be more of him in the coming installments, it's safe to say that Sephiroth will continue to inspire boss fights, both epic and sexy. In his own words, Watashiwa. I'm the Fire Joker, and you've probably noticed that a lot of these lists contain repeated entries. Yeah, there's a way we could work with that. Subtle, dear. Hey, you didn't marry me for my subtlety. No, no, I did not. But no regrets. God. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching. <laughs>